we're just gonna wait maybe just one more minute. I know it's um, early and folks might still be getting morning beverage. So good morning and welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started um, with our first CSPAR seminar talk of 2021 and our first new faces um, talk of the 2020-21 series. Uh, before we um, have our first speaker of the morning, I'm gonna invite Sandra Dost to speak with us about the CFAR immunology course. So Sandra, go ahead and take it away. Morning, everyone. Uh, so I just want to take to take a brief minute to highlight the virology and immunology core. So this is a non-human primate subcore within the CFAR immunology core, and we offer fee-for-service uh, specimen processing assays and a repository of non-human primate uh, cryopreserved cells. So this core is really ideal for early investigators who are needing lab support, but that are not really ready to commit to a full-time lab or 100% uh, FTE technician or any investigator that needs extra hands or non-human primate cells to um, do some experiments. So we have several specimen processing and assays offered. We process PBMC and plasma uh, tissue from surgery or necropsy. We have multi-parameter flow cytometry, including uh, immunophenotyping and intracellular staining. We run SIV and SHIV viral loads by RT-PCR. And we also offer Luminex, ELISA, and LSPA. And our processing protocols are very flexible, and we have have uh, new assays always in development. Um, lastly, we have a non-human primate cryopreserved specimen repository that is available to uh, all investigators. So please contact the director of the VNIC, which is Deb Fuller, and I've listed her email, or myself, I'm the VNIC manager, um, for all inquiries. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll switch the screen sharing here for a moment. So Megan, go ahead and you can pull up your slides. Okay. And we're super excited to be starting off um, our seminar series this morning with our, again, our first new faces of the year, which is Dr. Megan O'Connor. Dr. O'Connor is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Microbiology at UW. And she has extensive exper um, expertise in immunology and is passionate about research for HIV AIDS, as well as Zika virus and Zika pathogenesis because of its clinical applicability, global rele relevance, and the opportunity to make a human impact. As a postdoctoral researcher, uh, Dr. O'Connor is building upon her graduate training in marine immunology and extensive years of viral and vaccine immunology in non-human primate models. Dr. O'Connor, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me and see my slides okay before I get started? Yes, you sound great and the slides look beautiful. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I would just like to thank the CFAR for giving me an opportunity to talk about my work today and for, for everybody attending in, in real time or uh, are watching this after it is being recorded. But uh, today I'm gonna to be telling you about um, the ongoing work that I've been doing to develop a non-human primate model of Zika co-infection in people living with HIV. So a brief overview of my talk, I'm gonna be giving a background on plague viruses and why it's important to, uh, to study them. The work that we've been doing to develop a non-human primate model to study HIV Zika co-infection. And last, I'm gonna leave you with some of our future directions as well as uh, the big picture goals of um, my lab. So first, uh, just to start with a little bit of a background on, on plague viruses. So this map is showing um, since the 1980s or in the past 40 years, the different emerging as well as re-emerging infectious diseases, um, different outbreaks that, that we have had. But what I really want to highlight is that um, over the past 40 years, we've had uh, several different outbreaks of different flaviviruses um, shown here in the green boxes. Now, uh, the most well-known flaviviruses are shown here um, with dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, and most recently uh, Zika. And all of these flaky viruses are transmitted by mosquito. Um, and there are several different features about flaky viruses that make them worth investigating. First of all, a majority of flaky viruses are resulted in subclinical or asymptomatic infections, um, which means we're often unable to maybe capture um, all of the, the different clinical cases out there. Increases in travel have caused glap of, uh, rapid global spread of, of these viruses. And there's the concern that with climate change and redistribution of mosquitoes, there could be rapid spread of these viruses to new populations. Additionally, there's no effective widespread vaccines against many of these uh, viruses. 
And these viruses infect um, a variety of high-risk populations, including children, pregnant women, as well as immunocompromised individuals. There's this large global impact of clade virus infection. Um, dengue infects up to 390 million people a year. And when we've had different outbreaks of other, other flavy viruses, we see that in a given year, we can get hundreds of thousands to millions of people infected. And so this is really just emphasizing that there can be this really um, uh, massive impact of flavy virus infection. And although I'm just kind of highlighting some of the, the uh, major players here, there, are, there is the potential threat of different emerging uh, flavy viruses. So some of these flavy viruses have caused small local outbreaks in human populations um, with the potential of causing more um, widespread infection, whereas some of these flavy viruses are currently in mostly just in animal hosts, but if, if they are able to mutate and move into a human host, we could then have a potential flavy virus outbreak in the future. And so um, this just then emphasizes the importance of, of studying flavivirus infections. And we are overall using the model of Zika infection as a model of flavivirus infection. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go into you know, why, why, we're, why we're using this versus uh, other different models. Um, so in addition to being transmitted by mosquito bite, uh, this virus can also be transmitted vertically as well as sexually. And although it mostly causes uh, mild symptoms, there can be severe complications um, such as uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome um, when it invades into the CNS, as well as congenital Zika syndrome in infants that are exposed in utero. However, there can be several different limitations with study human Zika infection. As I've mentioned, most of the infections are asymptomatic, which means we might not be capturing uh, some of these cases in the clinic. Uh, the, the incubation time is uh, three to 14 days, which means we're really able to, uh, unable to capture some of the early uh, innate immune responses that are really important uh, for understanding more about the pet pathogenesis. Many of the symptoms are indistinct with other flaviviruses as well as other viruses, which means that um, if not correctly confirmed, they could go incorrectly diagnosed, as well as some of at least the initial uh, diagnostic tests for Zika had high cross-reactivity with other flaviviruses. Um, as well as the, there's the potential that some of these emerging in, um, flavy viruses could be um, serologically indistinct um, with, uh, with Zika virus. And currently a limitation that we have is that there are low case numbers, which makes it difficult to study uh, pathogenesis in humans. So we use the pigtail macaque model of Zika infection. And these animals uh, make good hosts for studying the infection because they are um, naturally natural hosts of infection in that we can actually take uh, human, uh, human isolates from a Zika infection and give it directly to our, our, our non-human primates. Uh, so far, the model resemb resembles human disease quite well in that it leads to a, a mild course of, of infection. And in this model, we're able to get uh, vertical transmission that can lead to different fetal complications. So I'm not gonna be talking to you about the work um, that we did to develop our, um, our initial model, but instead I'm gonna be highlighting the ongoing work that we've been doing to develop a non-human primate model to study HIV Zika co-infection. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of a step back and again, highlight, you know, why should we be studying uh, flaviviruses in people living with HIV? And so this map is showing in uh, purple, green, as well as blue, the different areas in countries in which we've had a Zika and dengue infections with the different levels of HIV seroprevalence. So the darker shades are showing higher HIV uh, prevalence uh, with the lighter shades showing less. So overall, this is just showing that you can see, especially um, um, in, in this kind of region here, that there is this large geographic overlap of people living with HIV and having flavivirus co-infections. But unfortunately, there's actually very uh, little known about the impact that flavivirus co-infection can have on people li living with HIV. And most of the studies that have been done are actually limited to, to case studies. Um, and so therefore, it's really important to be understanding more about how flaviviruses, uh, how pathogenesis, um, flavivirus pathogenesis could be um, altered in people living with HIV. We think that there could be several different risks to people living with HIV, HIV including that Zika pathogenesis could be exacerbated. Um, there could be the potential for, for increased uh, neuropathologies. What influence might art treatment have on Zika, Zika replication? 
And one of the concerns would be how could co-infections um, mitigate the efficacy of uh, prophylactic vaccine strategies for Zika or any therapeutic interventions for HIV. So to study this, we are expanding upon our pigtail macaque model of, SI, uh, of Zika infection. And so because these animals are also susceptible to um, simian immunodeficiency virus or SIV, as well as SIV HIV hybrids or, or SHIV, we can then um, combine our Zika models with our, our SIV SHIV uh, AIDS models in order to uh, study co-infection. So the question that we had with these initial studies is what impact does HIV infection have on Zika pathogenesis? And our hypothesis is that enhanced Zika pathogenesis occurs in HIV infected individuals and that monocytes could be a major player in driving this increased pathogenesis. And these hypotheses are based off of several pieces of evidence. Uh, first of all, during both HIV as well as SIV infection, we see that uh, CD16 positive monocytes, this is shown during um, SIV infection, we see significant increases in CD16 positive monocytes in the blood. And here I'm showing uh, data in chronically infected HIV infected individuals, again, seeing increases in these CD16 positive monocytes. These monocytes um, have been known to be able to um, harbor both HIV as well as SIV uh, viruses. Similarly, during um, Zika infection, this occurred both in humans as well as NHPs, we see significant expansion of CD16 positive monocytes in these, uh, this acute phase of infection. Um, and again, this is actually showing data from um, uh, animals that were infected just with uh, Zika. And again, just kind of highlighting that there can be these really early uh, immune responses that we're gonna be missing in some of the human infection if we're not catching them into the clinic until uh, one to two weeks after um, the initial exposure. But why studying uh, monocytes is really important is because um, we, as well as others, have identified that CD16 positive non-classical monocytes are the major targets of Zika infection um, in the blood. Uh, so um, in ad addition, um, monocytes have been shown to mediate uh, both HIV as well as flavivirus invasion into the CNS. And it's hypothesized that this is a mechanism in which uh, Zika can, be can become neurotropic. So overall, our proposed mechanism of HIV enhanced pathogenesis is that um, in an HIV infected individual, we would have expansion of uh, monocyte populations, in particular CD16 positive monocytes. And because these are the cellular targets of Zika infection, uh, we then have the potential to have um, increased Zika replication, pathogenesis, disease, as well as the uh, potential to have monocyte mediated invasion of Zika into the CNS. So I'm first just gonna highlight some of our uh, pilot work um, this was uh, in part funded through the Sexually Transmitted Infectious uh, Cooperative Research Center, as well as through the Washington National Primate Research Center, in which we were able to do a pilot study in which we had uh, three female pigtail macaques. These animals were infected with, with SIV, and then we were able to co-infect them with a Zika Brazilian isolate uh, nine weeks after the SIV infection. And a question I often get is why did we decide to do um, acute SIV infection rather than chronic SIV infection that's art treated? And really the ultimate goal of these initial studies was really to create an environment um, of, uh, of immunosuppression so that we could get exaggerated uh, Zika phenotypes. But we have, um, but we are very interested moving forward to take this model into um, a chronic infection with, with heart treatment as well. So these animals were uh, co-infected with, with Zika, and then we were able to compare them to both uh, contemporary female uh, pigtail macaques that were infected with the same viral isolate, as well as historical females that had been uh, infected in a previous cohort. And then during the course of uh, both the SIV and Zika phases, we were able to collect blood as well as different tissue specimens um, throughout the course so that we could monitor uh, the viral burden in these animals as well as different immune responses. And again, I really just wanna highlight um, that in particular, we can be collecting different specimens within um, the first couple of days of infection. Um, and, as you can, and as you'll see with, with the data, there's actually quite a lot that's going on in those first couple of uh, days. So we first wanted to identify um, what impact SIV infection was having on um, the expansion of monocytes in different tissues. 
So we were looking at uh, CD16 positive monocytes or uh, monocytes der monocyte uh, derived uh, cells in both the blood as well as different tissues. And this was looking at seven weeks post SIV infection, which was our, our tissue surgery time point prior to our Zika co-infection. And although we only had a small cohort of animals, uh, what you can see is that we were actually seeing significant increases in monocytes uh, to the tissues as well as trending in the blood. Um, so this is an indicative that we are getting recruitment of potential Zika cellular targets uh, with SIV infection. We were then overall monitoring the SIV, uh, SIV disease progression in these animals. This is showing the plasma viremia, in which all three of our animals had peak viremia about two weeks post-infection and then hit viral set point four to seven weeks post-infection. When we then co-infected these animals, we saw that viremia actually stayed uh, stable uh, when we followed them out uh, three weeks after the infection. We also monitored, monitored uh, CD4 uh, depletion in the blood in these animals. Um, and this line here is showing uh, 200 uh, cells uh, per microliter of blood. And what we actually noticed is um, for these animals, we actually saw rapid CD4 uh, decline. This was a little bit more aggressive than we had originally anticipated, in which we had two animals that had actually reached uh, what we would consider AIDS criteria uh, prior to our Zika co-infection. But um, similar to kind of what we saw with the, the SIV viremia, when we co-infected these animals with Zika, uh, we didn't see any continual de uh, CD4 depletion in any of these animals. And then lastly, to monitor SIV disease progression, um, as, as many of us are aware, you know, the gut is a major site of both HIV as well as SIV pathogenesis. So that during infection, we see that there's a preferential depletement, depletion of Th17 cells. These cells are really important for uh, maintenance of uh, gut barrier. And so with depletion, we see a breakdown of the gut epithelial barrier uh, leading to microbial translocation. Uh, this can then lead to persistent immune activation, exhaustion, as well as inflammation. And so in our animals, we wanted to uh, look at different uh, parameters in the plasma that could be indicative of this breakdown of the epithelial barrier. So we were looking at both uh, soluble CD14, which is also a marker of monocyte activation, as well as levels of LPS binding protein. And what we saw was that during uh, the acute phases of the SIV infection, uh, we saw increases in both of these parameters in our animals. However, these levels returned back to baseline prior to our Zika uh, co-infection. After the Zika co-infection, what we can then see is that there is this secondary wave of uh, increase, uh, again, demonstrating that Zika co-infection um, is leading to the potential um, activation of different monocytes. And what I wasn't really able to talk about earlier is we actually have shown that Zika can infect um, the gut mucosa. So again, this could be uh, suggesting that Zika infection could also be leading to breakdown of the epithelial barrier. So this preliminary data was showing that Zika co-infection increased markers of AIDS progression in the gut, including microbial translocation, but we weren't really seeing any significant impact of viremia or CD4 depletion in the blood. We next wanted to monitor the, the Zika infection in these animals. So first, if we wanted to look at our control animals, here in black, I'm showing our contemporary controls, and in gray, I'm showing our historic controls, and this is looking at the Zika plasma viremia. What we overall consistently see is that peak viremia occurs uh, two to four weeks post-infection. In our contemporary uh, cohort, we did see overall lower levels of, of plasma viremia, and this is still something that we are um, investigating. When we then looked at uh, plasma viremia and our SIV infected animals shown here in red, we saw a slight delay in uh, the peak to viremia, anywhere from four to seven days post-infection, um, with a little bit more of a persistence of viremia. And although this is um, a, a small number of animals, this data is actually uh, consistent with the work that was recently published by Jason Brenchley, in which he had rhesus macaques rather than pigtail macaques shown in this study that were also acutely infected with SIV and then co-infected with Zika. And he similarly saw, delay, uh, saw delays in, a, a plasma, uh, in Zika plasma viremia. So uh, this is very consistent with these findings. Um, additionally, we were looking at the recruitment of CD16 positive monocytes after the Zika infection, 
And what we characteristically see is with uh, usually at day two, we see this significant increase in CD16 positive monocytes. And this is consistent with both our contemporary as well as our historical controls. But in contrast, when we looked at our SIV infected animals, we saw this slight delayed as well as dampened expansion of, of these monocyte populations. So overall, this evidence was suggesting that SIV infection may be altering um, Zika viral uh, clearance, and there could be a role of innate immune cells. So just to kind of summarize some of these preliminary findings, what we normally see during Zika infection is there's this uh, rapid infection in the blood that's leading to the recruitment of different innate immune cells and the induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Many of these cells are targets of Zika infection, which then leads to the further uh, replication of these virus, further recruitment of innate immune cells, and eventually we have an antiviral response um, that can lead to clearance of the virus. However, um, what we've seen so far with Zika infection is that after we have this infection, we see um, less recruitment of innate immune cells. Um, and because there are less potential Zika cellular targets, um, this may lead to a slower uh, Zika replication, as well as a more dampened uh, recruitment of innate immune cells leading to delayed viral clearance. So, uh, lastly, I just want to uh, touch on some of our future directions as well as um, our big picture goals. So um, using data from our pilot study, um, I was able to get a KO1 so that we could enroll more animals into this study. And so our first cohort of animals was just enrolled in November, in which we are able to recruit four additional animals into our co-infected group and four animals into our Zika-only group. And so we're really excited about being able to really uh, understand more about the impact of um, the SIV Zika co-infection um, in, in these animals, as well as um, we have additional assays that we are, are working on. Um, so one thing that we've been working on is an in vitro assay to evaluate uh, Zika co-infection. And so this is using peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs that are like isolated by, from naive animals or animals that are SIV infected. Then in vitro, we can co-infect them with Zika and we can monitor the, the Zika viral replication. Um, additionally, we are then using flow cytometry um, to characterize these uh, cells prior to their Zika infection so that we can correspond the amounts of uh, viral replication with the frequencies of different Zika cellular targets. And so this is showing preliminary data from animals from our KO1 prior to their SIV infection. So these are the four animals that we have enrolled. And what you can just see is we do get um, consistent uh, uh, Zika replication in these cells and uh, peak replication occurs at 24 hours. And the ultimate goal of these studies is once we've been able to characterize this and see how it relates to um, SIV Zika co-infection in vivo, um, our ultimate goal is to be able to en enroll women um, that are both um, HIV negative as well as HIV positive and do uh, similar studies to understand the role of um, Zika co-infection in people living with HIV. And then further down the long line, we would really like to be able to also enroll pregnant women so that we could start to understand the impact of co-infection could have um, during pregnancy. And then also uh, we have ongoing work uh, through the CFAR. I received an ICFAR award. And so for this study, what we are doing is we're collecting and storing uh, different PBMC specimens from our pilot as well as our KO1 animals. And then once we've been able to identify the overall Zika burden in these animals, we can identify different specimens based off of a gradient of this viral burden to really uh, prioritize initially certain samples. And then working with the CFAR uh, single cell quantitative RNA-seq core, um, we're going to be forming um, RNA sequencing so that we can start to understand um, the role of type 1 interferons as well as different innate immune pathways that are associated with Zika pathogenesis uh, during SIV infection. And lastly, I just want to leave you with the overall uh, goal of um, my research program moving forward, which is to develop novel platforms to evaluate the risks of emerging infectious diseases and other co-infections in people living with HIV. So this first involves developing novel preclinical models of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. And what I'm just highlighting here is the work that I've done with Zika virus. Once we've then characterized those diseases, we can put them into our SIV infection model so we can evaluate whether infectious diseases are being altered in people living with HIV. And then using this, we can determine different immune factors that are associated with altered disease pathogenesis that could help in the development 
of different treatments and vaccine strategies uh, for people living with HIV. And so lastly, I just want to acknowledge um, my mentor, uh, Deb Fuller, and the, the different members in my, in my lab, as well as my uh, co-mentor, uh, Michael Gale, um, and different collaborators, uh, both externally as well as internally, uh, the Department of Primate Resources uh, for the care of the animals, and lastly, uh, my different funding sources. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Very, very nice job, Megan. Thank you so much. Um, so we will, um, if folks have questions, please either, um, best way to do it is to put it in the Q&A um, box and I can go ahead and read those to, to Megan. So we do have one question right now, um, which is given your recently published, you published a paper noting that monkeys in the primate center colony um, are and have been infected with valley fever, and that this co-infection compromises their utility as models in HIV studies, how do you know that these data have also not been compromised? Uh, that is a great question. And I, I, I am impressed that somebody had read that, that recent publication. Yeah, so, so a, a lot of our colony comes from um, Arizona. And so that is actually an area that has endemic valley fever infection, which is a fungal infection. And so um, usually what happens is we screen these animals uh, for valley fever uh, prior to enrollment in, in our study. And if they are then positive, they will get uh, treated for valley fever. So we did have a case uh, to, uh, this was unrelated to, to our, our Zika studies in which we did actually have an animal that had been treated with valley fever and it had a recrudescence of the infection um, when we infected the animal uh, with, with SIV. Um, and so something that we are making sure to, to do in our studies is that prior to enrollment in, in these studies as well as other studies is uh, we screen the animals for, uh, for valley fever uh, prior to, the, to this. And now we are making sure to exclude any animals that have a history of valley fever. Um, additionally, we make sure to screen our animals for flavivirus infections uh, before being enrolled into our study to make sure that that does not compromise our, our, our study. But that, that's an excellent question that with NHPs um, as well as with, with humans, you can actually have some baseline infections that could be influencing uh, your, your studies. Okay, thanks to our question asker and, um, and for that response. Any other questions? We have about one more minute. We could take, a, take another question for Megan. Give folks a second to potentially type stuff in. I'm not seeing any other. Well, if folks have questions as you as you're um, as you're here this morning, um, feel free to continue to add them for in the um, Q and A. And Megan, there's an option for you to respond via text if you're able to stay on with us this morning. And if anyone has additional questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your work with us this morning. It sounds like you have a, um, well, it doesn't sound like you do, face um, an incredible foundation for a really great research program that you're building. And um, it's really exciting. And we look forward to having you back as things develop and sharing your findings. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody.